in my pocket. Oh. Honestly. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, just had an excellent morning. We've learned about exoplanet detection. Uh, we've learned about biospheres that may work with the arsenic in place of, uh, of phosphorus. Uh, we've learned about structure of language and communication. And I've had a smashing lunch talking to some very interesting people. So now for an afternoon session. If, the, uh, if all the latecomers make it too. Hi, Lisa. And they even have a dessert. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Which Paul Davis refers to as the eerie silence. Have our, oh, our own radio frequency signals have leaked into space? Are we giving away too much information about our presence? Or should we deliberately attract attention? Should contact with extraterrestrial intelligence be sought? Or is it the last thing that we should do? Or even if we go ahead, the last thing that we will do? <laughs> or is this whole discussion obsolete because such an endeavor will not succeed anyway? I will leave all further emerging questions to our panelists. Complex question can be divided into Two simple questions. To send or not to send, that is calling. And to answer or not to answer. He's listening to radio message. Just the fact to receive a message will say, okay, we are not allowed. We don't need the decoding. We need somebody to have a message with artificial. Uh, because there's a lot of derivation, a lot of quantitative estimation and a discussion of policy issues, and what I'm going to do in 15 minutes is summarize what's in that paper. Now, those are sobering consequences. Here's an example of the cost of a beacon that would have an interstellar range of 1,000 light years. The graph vertically is the cost in billions of American dollars, uh, and the beacon power is given in gigawatts at the bottom. And you can see there's a trade-off between the cost of power and the cost of the antenna. And it's Which, minimized. Uh, I'd like to suggest today that we try to do this in a slightly more disciplined way. It seems to me that something that's happened over the past 16 years or so is that we have gradually accepted the relevance of the external universe to our civilization here on Earth. What? Broadcasting, should we hit the mute button? <coughs> uh, I'd like to say that I'm going to be a little bit emotional in my short presentation here, which I know does not comport well with the British national character and probably violates the Magna Carta. However, I'm going to do it to maybe provoke a higher energy level amongst the opponents. I would like to point out here, by the way, that those of us who think that the broadcasting might not be a bad idea uh, represent a, a multinational group, whereas those opposed are relentlessly American. <laughs> All right. But the argument is that signaling our presence could provoke hostile aliens with dire consequences. Now this is speculative. Of course it's speculative. Because, in fact, our data set on alien sociology, which is what we're invoking here, is sparse. We have no idea. But the argument is that doesn't matter. You cannot take chances because there's too much at stake. There's a long lever arm here. I came up okay. here expecting perhaps one of the three of you to argue from ridicule. I was surprised to find that it was all three. Um, let me just not to me force its way out of all species, and there are almost none of those. Um, lately, uh, it, uh, it, it, I called it the Great si Silence. Uh, Paul um, um, recently. Um, Paul what? Davies. Davies recently wrote uh, The Eerie Silence. <clears throat> you can, uh, one of the things that's most depressing about this field is that people tend to choose their own explanations for the Fermi uh, paradox and glom onto them with passion that is unmerited in a field that has no subject matter at all. And, and we're, we're so passionate. We think this is the explanation, this is the explanation. And I've realized there's something fascinating. 
those who believe in the uniqueness of humanity tend to, you, tend to grab onto Drake factors on the left side. Planets are rare, uh, life is rare, the evolution of intelligence is likely to be rare. And one of their reasons for doing so is that that puts the big filter, the thing that's keeping the numbers down, behind us. Whereas, people in the SETI field very often have optimistic numbers for the number of planets, likelihood of, of life, etc., those numbers. But then you saw Carl Sagan turn around and say, get all gloomy about humanity's likelihood of survival with nuclear winter. Remember all that? Because it's the late factors in the, in the expanded Drake equation. The Drake equation itself is no good. But if you include things like ship speed and uh, approach avoidance cross-section, and a couple of additional factors, you get something that actually makes some predictive value. And the SETI um, um, orthodoxy tends to pick on these. Ship speed is small. Interstellar travel is, is unlikely to ever occur or is very unlikely. Um, or lifespan is small for those that might be aggressive, and so only the altruists are left. What I'm trying to give you the impression is that this is a very, very complex topic, and we should rejoice in its complexity. It's the most interesting topic you can find. Why do you think I've spent my life in it? <laughs> bringing in our best sages. Should we not be bringing in historians, biologists, anthropologists, and yes, there's the possibility that they may ask for a moratorium. That should not frighten us. Because you know what? You're right, Seth. If we keep a free and open civilization filled with rambunctious individualist amateurs, in 20 years, people are going to have this, the wherewithal in their backyards to shout you who no matter what. And I want to fight for a free, open civilization that will make my efforts at this point futile after 20 years. The only kind of civilization that could clamp down and stop it would be either a tyranny or if we learned something over the next 20 years that made most people go, maybe we'd all better refrain. But here's the point. We're learning fast. If we weren't, I would not be in favor of these discussions and all of that. Fifteen years ago, how long is it, Lisa? Fifteen years ago, we knew of zero planets outside the solar system. Is it about 15? 95. Okay. Hey, I'm good. Fifteen years ago, we knew of... Well, it's, uh, it's tea break now. We've had a fascinating discussion. Uh, just finished. I'm, I'm with Lisette Petrie, who's a tutor on the OU's S283 um, Planetary Science and Search for Life course. Lisette, have you been as fascinated as I have by this meeting? I have certainly, yes. We had some wonderful lectures this morning on exoplanets and some bits of astrobiology that were quite stretching, I found, but absolutely fascinating nevertheless. But this last discussion meeting that we've been having this afternoon, um, was all about the question of whether we should be communicating with extraterrestrials or not. I and found that absolutely fascinating. Yes. It was. Sure thing. Yeah. I, I, I didn't expect so much acrimony. At least. No, no, I didn't. I had. I knew that it was a controversial topic, but I hadn't realised that people, that emotions were running quite so high among the great and the good. Me neither. Well, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll we'll find out how emotions are running uh, a little while when we go back in. And details. Thanks, Lisette. Okay. So, too, it seems it's easy to imagine that we must either advocate um, international consultation or advocate doing active SETI. Uh, today, I'd like to argue that we can and should do both, looking for ways to conduct active SETI while being cautious in the process. Uh, I will not, however, be calling for a moratorium on active SETI projects. Rather, I will propose a planful development of active SETI that encourages, rather than bypasses, international consultation and discussion. ...has the opportunity, perhaps, to pick up transients. Now, if you click one more time, we'll go back to the SETI 2020 and the third recommendation, which was that SETI, at 40 years of age at that time, 
um, should have its own telescope to do SETI 24-7. Well, it was a long day. Uh, it's been thoroughly enjoyable. I wasn't entirely sure how valuable it would be to me, but it's been of uh, immense value. So I'm very much looking forward to the second day tomorrow.